All right, what's up? Welcome, everybody. Uh, we are live. Hopefully, uh, you can hear me okay and the sounds good with Luigi. Christian Mario, Christian Luigi, we got it all. We got <laughs> next up, we got Christian Peach, Christian Toadstool. I'll be Toadstool. I'm the best. How's that? Christian Yoshi. Yes. Um, good job on the debate, man. Uh, we're going to be reviewing it today. We're going to get deep into the conversation. I've got it pulled up here. <clears throat> um, I'll give you my uh, initial assessment. I thought that it went pretty good on both sides in the sense of it being a good, civil, um, informative debate. Both sides brought, uh, I guess, probably better versions of this argument than we typically hear on a lot of apologetic channels. I mean, I think that the orthodox side usually wins this debate, unless there's somebody that I haven't seen that's like really low tier or something. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that uh, the Rocky Balboa voice dude, he tried his best. I mean, uh, I think that if he's new to all this, I don't know how long he's been studying this. Um, you know, he's, he's doing good for being a new guy, I guess. Uh, I think you are rel relatively new, which I think is pretty impressive because you did really well in this debate. So thanks for joining me. Um, where do you want to kick it off? I, I, again, I think overall it was a lot of the typical quote minds. And mm -hmm. even though I said that it was a good debate, even though it's using a lot of the same old quote minds, I think that this debate handled the context of the quote minds very well because a lot of times what happens in this debate is that the machine gun quote minds are spit out right. and nobody ever gets to deal with the context and i think you guys at least not in every passage that he he threw out there at the beginning but in many of the passages you actually got to go into the context and to show the roman catholic audience that hey wait a minute a lot of these things that you think are kind of like kill shots there's more context to this and it's a lot deeper, more uh, charitably nuanced when we get deep into it. So welcome, Luigi. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I would agree with your assessment that I think in many ways their strategy is to just machine gun fire as many points of papal primacy um, as they can so that I, you know, that we don't have an opportunity to actually look into the context. And that's why I started my opening statement very intentionally with clarifying what our position is and what their position is, because his burden of proof, as per the actual title of the debate, was Vatican I, right? And so that's why I read the definition. Well, this was, a, yeah, this was a huge mistake at the beginning on his side. Um, I couldn't believe that he didn't actually read the definition or define the papal view a la Vatican I. He immediately went into the proof text and as I recall, I wrote in my notes, where did he actually give the definition of what Vatican I says it is? And in my view, this is typically because most Roman Catholics don't actually go read the text of Vatican I. They don't actually know what it is. I'm not saying that Alex uh, doesn't know it. Maybe he does. But he should have included that in his, in his opening statement. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of times what I see, especially on Twitter and, you know, other various debates with kind of low tier is people are convinced of the Roman Catholic position because they don't understand the Eastern Orthodox position. They think that these quotations by St. Irenaeus that talk about um, the significance of the Roman See that this somehow proves the Roman Catholic position. And that's why I was clarifying right off the bat with my opening statement that we, our position perfectly allows for these statements of honor towards Rome. And yeah. then I demonstrated how a lot of these quotes are applied to Constantinople. They're applied to the emperor. Um, and so we have to be consistent with this type of language. We can't just only apply it literally to the Roman see um, and then not apply it literally to the emperor or to Constantinople. Yeah. <clears throat> I thought there, there were many examples that you used that came up. I've got some of my own pulled up where we see this um, that doesn't fit the Roman Catholic model. So I think that the key point at the beginning here that you're making I totally agree with is that a lot of the quotations can be understood in either model so they don't necessarily prove either paradigm uh, we're going to need more than just this or that quote you know Rome has a uh, Peter spoke through Leo and that can be interpreted in either system it's not a knockdown kill shot you know a lot of these older proof texts um, just don't really work like they used to now that people are digging into the material but Another thing I would say is that uh, the recent Shosensky book that's come out that's really good, uh, Orthodoxy, uh, <coughs> the Papacy and the Orthodox, he has a great um, chapter, uh, I think it's chapter three, four, 
Chapter 4 is all about um, the Roman church in the first seven centuries and what that role is. And he actually works through a lot of these classic quote proof texts and points out that some of these that were used by uh, Lofton, Luigi, not, not Luigi, uh, Lofton and, and uh, uh, Voice of Reason oh. and, and others, um, they're not even used anymore. In fact, he mentions like the Clement text. Clement hasn't been used as a proof text for Vatican I in the scholarly literature, according to Sushinsky, since the 1960s. Um, and we're going to look at the Alexandria document as well to point out that the updated Vatican-approved Alexandria document and the Chieti document of uh, a few years before that really also undercut most of the, or many at least, of the proof texts that uh, he relied so heavily on. So um, in his opening statement, uh, you know, he starts out, we'll get into this, he talks about um, the, the uh, Richard Price text. And so I'll, I'll, if you want to comment on that, you can. But my first thought when you mentioned this was, well, actually, if you remember, uh, they had Richard Price on. And I think that, I'm not positive, but they might have actually taken this interview down. Maybe it's still up. I don't really follow that channel. I don't know. But they were kind of embarrassed uh, when they interviewed Richard Price on this very question that uh, Alex raised in the debate. Have you seen this clip? Yeah, the one where he admits that the East didn't recognize the supreme authority um, coming from the papal see. Um, I mean, he just blatantly admits it, and you can yeah. kind of see him walking and, and yeah. part of the action. Uh, yeah, let me play that. It's a real brief clip, and then I'll let yeah. you uh, comment on whatever you saw uh, in his opening statement that you first wanted to go after. Why did the bishops in Chalcedon feel they needed to judge Theodore if Leo had already reinstated him? Well... Um, they didn't, they didn't recognize Roman jurisdiction in the Eastern provinces. So, uh, Leo's, uh, reinstating, for them was not decisive. The decision has to be made in the East. Um, um, the, 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 Theodoric's position at the council is a very interesting one. Uh, when the... Anyway, so it wasn't yeah. recognized in the East. And why might he say that? Well, one reason he might say that is the uh, last statement in... Uh, where I've got it pulled up here. I've got so many tabs open, it takes me a second to find it. The last statement in... Um, the Sardica one, by the way, is, is great on, uh, so, yeah. And, and we'll, let's go ahead and, because he, he, he hinged a lot, on, or attempted to hinge a lot on Sardica as uh, Ibarra does, which is surprising to me that Ibarra, I don't have his book, but, I mean, has he even read any of the responses on Sardica from his own team? <laughs> the Vatican website for um, uh, Eastern uh, Affairs Put out this document it says over the centuries a number of appeals were made to the bishop of rome from the east in disciplinary matters such as the deposition of a bishop an attempt was made at the senate of sardica in 343 to establish rules for this procedure sardica was received at the council of trollo in 692 the canons of sardica determined that a bishop who had been condemned could appeal to the bishop of rome and that the latter if he deemed appropriate might order a retrial to be conducted by the bishops in the province neighboring the bishop's own Appeals regarding disciplinary matters were also made to the see of Constantinople and to other sees. This is a point that I made in my original Ibarra debate, and here now Rome admits it. Such appeals were made to major sees and always treated in a synodical way. So not in a unilateral papal way, in a synodal way. <clears throat> appeals to the Bishop of Rome from the East expressed the community of the church, but the Bishop of Rome did not exercise canonical authority over the churches of the East. This is a papally approved ecumenical document from Francis admitting the very point that Luigi was arguing, contrary to Alex in the debate. Was that the Alexandrian or the Chieti? This is Chieti. It's the last paragraph to yeah. the Chieti. Yeah, and there's similar quotations in the Alexandria. Yeah, we're going to go to Alexandria here in a minute. Another point, you know, and I brought this up in my rebuttal, um, and I, 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 I hope people caught it because there's significance whenever the Tome of Leo is brought up. I mean, Father Richard Price does them no favors when it comes to the Tome of Leo. Um, I mean, he specifically says, and this is the quotation that 
uh, that I think is significant. I mean, he says that nothing could be more indicative of the mood of the council than the fact that even Theodoret had to defend the tome of Leo by appealing to the authority of Cyril. Um, and I read the entire quotation in my in my uh, rebuttal, but it, it it's demonstrating that <clears throat> the the tome of Leo was under scrutiny. I mean, they took days. To yeah, this was actually, yeah, this was, out. by the way, this was in the Denny book. So Denny, mm -hmm. uh, a long time ago, had made this thesis. Roman Catholics would attack that, by the way. And now here's Price backing up the very thing that Denny argued. Yeah, and um, another point there. So they took days to place the Tone of Leo under scrutiny. They paused the council. Um I think it was Atticus who requested that the council be paused so that they could, they could review the Tome of Leo to make sure it was orthodox. Um, and actually, this is a quote from the Acts as well. It says, Eusebius, the most devout bishop, uh, said, I judge the letter of the most holy Leo Archbishop of Senior Rome to, to accord with the definition of the 318 who assembled at Nicaea, with the council of the 150 who assembled in the great city of Constantinople, and with the council that took place at Ephesus under blessed Cyril. And thus I have signed it. So, and there's quotations by almost everyone that signed the document at the council stating the reason why it's orthodox is because it's aligned with these other councils that we've already had that, that, that say the same thing. Yeah, the councils actually begin that way too, right? The councils, when they, if you read the canons, for example, the oftentimes, later councils will oftentimes appeal and say, we in accord with the previous councils and canons. They don't say, we in accord with the Roman see and its judgments. Anyway, did you? So uh, that was my first uh, point of attack. There, a response was the accusation that Richard Price, again, uh, like you said, would afford him any, yeah, any but, real meat. Another point there, um, kind of backing up two years to Ephesus four forty nine. Um, what's interesting is the Tome of Leo was available and um, was distributed prior to Ephesus four forty nine, um, and yet that council. Now, obviously, it's a robber council. I mean, it's an obvious robber council. Um, Patriarch of Constantinople was, was basically murdered at that council. Um, but uh, that council didn't even talk about the Tome of Leo. Um, in fact, Leo writes to that council encouraging them to meet. He encouraged that that council occur. But wait a minute. If the Tome of Leo was the papal document that has already determined this, then why is he advocating for a council? It doesn't make sense. And then that's what, that's what follows. Yeah, this is exact. And this is a mirror to what we're going to see with Lateran 649 and the way that Constantinople three and 681 handles uh, what Pope Martin had said and what St. Uh, Maximus had said prior to that. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice it's not Martin, by the way, this is another point I meant to mention you before we went on air. Uh, I want to mention now before I forget it, if you read uh, Constantinople III, uh, I mean, the the theologians of the council are St. Sophronius uh, and Maximus. I mean, and there's I'm sure there's others as well, but the Confession of St. Sophronius, for example, is accepted at the council as an Orthodox Confession of Faith. The theological writings of St. Maximus condemning uh, Pyrrhus and the Monothelites, that's the theology of that council. It's not like the council just said, all we got to do is fact check what we believed, uh, you know, 50 years, 40, 50 years ago uh, via uh, Pope Martin. You know what I mean? Which right. had they had the Vatican one mindset, that's exactly the modus operandi they would have had. Right. And, and the significant point here is not only not only was Constantinople three, not a, not just looking at it as affirming what Pope Martin had determined, but it, I don't see any evidence they even acknowledge it. Um, like they don't, aren't even acknowledging what Pope, Pope Martin supposedly determined at Latin. Well, I, I'm going from memory here. And, and the more that I thought about this after you mentioned it before the show, um, I want to say that maybe there is in Denzinger or somewhere, there is a mentioning of Martin, but it's not treated like, uh, our pious predecessor, you know, uh, settled the issue. It's treated as one of many attestations. And it's not like Martin is the theologian of the council. It's Maximus. Are you saying that that, but I'm talking about at Constantinople three. Yeah, me too. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. I'm saying that I You're do, I think that I'm thinking back. I do think, for example, in Denzinger, I think there's a place 
I'm not positive, but I think there is a place where reference is made in Constantinople three to our predecessor, Martin, but it is not treated like uh, it's a, a definitive statement. In fact, as Denny, uh, not Denny, as uh, yeah, as Denny argues, uh, the the council investigates the letter of Agatho to see if it matches up with prior conciliar teaching. So that right there, investigating is the same model of investigating Leo's tome against Cyril, the same model that uh, I think Denny says they spent like a week or two investigating mm-hmm. Agatho's letter to see if it matches up. Investigating to test the orthodoxy of the Roman See is not the model of Vatican I, it's the opposite of it. Yeah, and and I mean, like you said uh, earlier as well, I mean, if, even if there is a quotation that's acknowledging Martin, um, the fact that the intention was for Lateran 649 to be ecumenical, but it's not recognized exactly. as ecumenical by Constantinople III or by any Roman Catholic for that matter. Yeah, and that was the question that you raised to him, and his response right. was, "Well, Constantinople three mentions Martin. Yeah, but so what? That 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 the point is not does it mention him? Does anybody consider him orthodox? The because Maximus went to Pope Saint Martin uh, in the Lateran Synod, the Lateran Basilica. And by the way, if you go to the Lateran, Lateran Basilica, uh, which we went a few weeks ago, the up front of the church is two people." Put up there equally in giant statues. Can you guess who those two equal uh, equal up there are? Quiz question. Two equal people. Yeah. Emperor and Pope. No. Uh, who who would Rome have traditionally considered the two equal apostles founding of Patriarch of Paul, Peter and Paul. Exactly. So the Lateran Basilica, prior to Vatican I, when it was renovated, still retained the traditional architecture. I think it was renovated in the 1700s. So prior to Vatican I, they were still putting up at the front, of, at, at the up by the the you know the altar, of the basilica, the ancient altar in the, the ancient area, Peter and Paul. So in other words, the tradition is still that it's Peter and Paul. I'm, I'm getting off track. I'm not trying to change the subject. But anyway, the point is just that well, Max, so Maximus would be appealing Maximus goes to to uh, Martin because he wants to secure the preeminent see, and this is the modus operandi of a lot of people in the in church history. Right, you want to get Rome on your side. For example, Basil, um, when he writes letters, I think sixty eight, nine, seventy, seventy one, seventy two, he's writing to Athanasius and he's saying, "Hey, we need to write to Rome to get Rome on our side to help solve." the uh the problems here uh with these Arians and the Matamaki and so forth right and he complains in that series of letters that Rome is a complete disaster they failed they're of no use in in saving the orthodox faith so literally no Vatican one mindset in any of those letters of Basil it's a great proof text for uh the attitude of the east which vindicates what we just saw in the Chieti document but also on top of that to mention that flowery language that you brought up quite a bit uh Basil says uh, that, uh, you know, I, th- I think he's talking about Melidius. I'm going from uh, from memory. He says he's the head of the churches. The whole body descends from him, right? He uses this kind of language. Oh, so I guess the patriarch of Antioch now is the, you know, the Pope of Rome. And, and so this flowery language is used quite often. And it doesn't always necessitate, as you pointed out, uh, the claims of Vatican I. And my next critique to get back on track, I'm sorry I went so far afield, but to get back on track with uh, you know the early quotes because he he kind of starts with Clement and he moves up from Clement uh, after mentioning Richard Price um, and he, he goes goes into Irenaeus and he tries to give these examples of that we always hear the, the Roman Catholic uh, apologists giving. Um, what I noticed was that there's kind of an, a lack of update on the scholarship because if you read the Sushinsky book, he points out that recent scholarship, both Orthodox and Catholic, is now kind of saying, look. There's a lot that we don't know about the letter of Clement, and it's not used anymore as a proof for Vatican I style papalism. In fact, he says it hasn't been used for that in like 50, 60 years because it's it just doesn't demonstrate what it's supposed to demonstrate. Um, and it, it's entirely possible that uh, it, it can also be read in both models. And a lot of these quotes can be read in both models. And I think that Sosinski makes this great point uh, in a lot of these, you know, classic proof texts, for example, Ignatius saying that the church presides in love, the Roman church presides in love. That used to be translated to mean this sort of uh, top-down autocratic presiding, but now the, they translate it differently. Oh, now it's translated as like a, um, 
just a, a, a charity based uh, relationship. And so one C writing across uh, to, to Corinth or something like that, right? The letters of the Corinthians, like that doesn't necessitate or demonstrate anything to do with the Vatican I claims because, as Sashensky points out, there's no, there's no appeal in, in Clement's letter to anything Matthew 16 or Petrine. There's not, it's not there. So in a lot of these quotes, it's like one sentence, the church of Rome that presides in love or, you know, uh, the church of the glorious church of, of the apostles, Peter and Paul. Like, so these quotes are then kind of given this Vatican one eisegesis when it's not actually there in the text. So does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. And I would also point out like St. Ignatius writes letters to other churches too. So does this prove that he had jurisdiction? That's a great point. Yeah. Jurisdiction over these other churches. That's um, a great point. And, and also, like Ibarra points out in his book, I think it's page like 127, 128 on his book, The Papacy, that the 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 quotation that you're referencing by Clement, St. Clement, is not an argument for the Catholic concept of the papacy. He specifically admits this. Um and well, then he's more up to date with a scholarship than right. his uh, buddy there. Right. Yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, I mean, that was mostly what I had to say about that. I mean, people will focus on whether or not, uh, you know, they'll, they'll bring up the fact that, Saint, you know, the Apostle John was still alive at the time. Um, obviously, there's debate over that. Uh, it, it's likely if he was alive, he was in exile at the time. Um but I don't see, like you're pointing out, I don't see how um, Corinth appealing to Rome is an issue, even if John is still alive. Yeah. Um, because Corinth, as far as I know, I know there's debate over this too, was within the jurisdiction of Rome. Um, I mean, it's, it's like there was, there was uh, Corinth uh, legates of the Roman see that were bishops of Corinth that represent ecumenical councils. So... I don't see why Corinth appealing to Rome is even like, even if John is still alive, even if we were to grant that, I don't see how that proves the papal claims. Yeah, I agree. It doesn't seem to be, it seems again, a non sequitur. And a lot of the uh, moves that uh, your opponent made in the debate, I, I felt like many of them were non sequiturs. Um, Sashinsky makes a great point too, uh, which is something that I've argued that I think that <clears throat> Roman Catholic op uh, opponents have not typically understood when we make this point, because <clears throat> they'll often say, <clears throat> as uh, Alex said in, in this debate many times, hey, uh, if if a bishop of Rome uh, does something unilateral and your church accepts him uh, as a saint, that proves Vatican I. Uh, I think that's a totally fallacious move because, number one, it's assuming the position, first of all, uh, because I can just as well interpret that as him ex exceeding his limitations and not necessarily becoming a heretic. St. Augustine made many theological mistakes. It doesn't make him a heretic. Um, we have bishops at time failing in making mistakes. Uh, uh, one of the uh, 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 early bishops of Rome, uh, right, becomes uh, St. Hippolytus was an antipope and then he repents of this, right? Uh, we have... Uh, uh, who is it? Uh, Pope Vigilius signing, uh, not Vigilius, uh, uh, signing the Arian Creed under duress and then repenting of that, right? What, oh, uh, Felix, Felix II. <laughs> yeah, so, so you have these these papal errors, people making mistakes and still being saints, okay? So m the mere fact that uh, bishops of Rome in the first thousand years make certain unilateral moves, we, we can fit that into an, an orthodox model without necessarily saying, oh, they're antichrist, right? Because as Sashinsky points out, <coughs> which is the very thing I argued to Ibarra in our debate uh, years ago, the Roman position is a thing that develops. It evolves. It's not like there's just this one, you know, unilateral move. And then from that point on, all the bishops of Rome continue that unilateral tradition. You get kind of a push-pull move. They'll try things, they back off. As we see with the next example that he gave, which is Pope Victor and the attempt uh, to excommunicate the East in terms of the quarter deseminarian controversy. And we know, and I'm glad you brought it up, that, and, and you actually called him out very well in this in the, in the discussion, because he says at one point in the debate, and I wrote the note down, that nobody opposed it. They all just, act, everyone in the church acted as if he had the ability to do this. That is not true. St. Irenaeus rebukes him for doing this, and he backs down. 
So the idea that just because the Pope acts unilaterally is not itself a proof of Vatican I. Yeah. Um, one, so you brought up the Arian con, uh, confession or profession of faith. That was Pope Liberius. Liberius. Pope, that's what I meant to say. Liberius. Pope Felix II, though, was an actual Arian. So Pope mm -hmm. Liberius was obviously under duress at the time. And even St. Athanasius says um, like he shouldn't be discredited because he was under duress at the time. But Pope Felix II, who I brought up, is a like was a legitimate Arian. Um, and they'll try to say he's a he's an anti-pope. But what's interesting about when they make claims about anti-popes is that there is no canonized list of popes. There is a document um, in Oario Pontifico that is is compiled by scholarship, but it's not canonized. It is not a dogmatic document in the Catholic Church. So they don't have a real list. How can you say someone's an anti-pope if you don't even have a list of who were legitimate popes? And a major issue that you brought up many times is the Avignon papacy, um, where we don't even know who the true pope was. You got three people. Yeah, we had an ecumenical council decide who the pope was, which is not Vatican I, by the way. <laughs> but um, yeah, exactly. And, and uh, uh, there's a lot of these. Kind of, I remember if you get the, uh, not Henry Chadwick, um, J.N.D. Kelly's book, Oxford History of the Pope, uh, he'll list in that book uh, the anti-popes. And I think it's even admitted in there that there's dispute over mm -hmm. some of the status of some of these. So you're absolutely right, because we don't have all, all the uh, historical documents and attestations that we might like in these early centuries. So there's some dispute about these things. In fact, Sosinski brings this up about Clement's letters that we don't know exactly what was going on uh, as to the reason why he wrote the letter to the Corinthians. There's a lot of uh, scholarly debate and speculation. Um, there's scholarly debate about to what degree Rome accepted uh, Trollo and uh, its decrees. Um, I know you talked about in the debate that, that's been brought up. There's a lot of books and debates and scholarship on this. I do think that who is Hadrian, I think eventually accepted uh, Trollo when it's read at Nicaea too. And a lot of Roman Catholics forget that Trollo affirms, uh, if I recall the way it works is Trollo affirms Carthage and then Trollo is read and accepted at Nicaea too. And then you get after that papal reversal and saying, no, no, we don't accept this, 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 this uh, in, in Trollo. So mm -hmm. that's my understanding of how that goes down. I know you, I know y'all got into that. We'll get into that in a little bit, but mm -hmm. um, did you have anything else you wanted to say on uh, the Pope St. Victor uh, Irenaeus issue? Because I felt like he was really uh, lagging behind on that one, not even aware of the fact that, uh, you know, St. Irenaeus famously opposed him on this. Well, yeah, and not only did St. Irenaeus oppose him, but like I bring up, the, pr the Pope prior to Victor, Antecedus, on the same issue, was, was, um, was confronted by Polycarp, and he backs down, which is evidence to my point that, and this is actually what St. Saint, Saint Irenaeus writes about, he writes about the apostolic sees having a, a, um, a higher authority than the other sees. Um, which is, which is why when Polycarp, who comes from an apostolic line directly from St. John, he was literally a disciple of St. John, Antecedes backs down when Polycarp confronts him. So that, how does that fit into a Vatican I model? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and the other thing, too, is that, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, you know I, I feel like he was really in a, between a rock and a hard place, defending the idea that, the Vatican I system was always there, which is, again, something I always point out that most Roman Catholic apologists in the academic world don't defend that thesis, even though that's pretty much what, what I think Satis Cognitum and, and uh, Pastor Eternus Vatican I say, is that it was always there, yet when a lot of questions are raised, we'll often see them shift over into the, well, it was a seed thing that developed the Newman thesis, right? Um, what's interesting is that we basically have Sashinsky saying that the, the norm now in the scholarship is, and we see this in the Chieti documents and in the Alexandria documents, is that no, this is a thing that develops, okay? Because the excuse that we've heard from Ibarra and from your opponent the other day that, well, <laughs> they always had this power, but they chose not to exercise it except in a few rare instances where they end up getting rebuked by the half of the church. So wait a minute. So this... Power is there to guide the church to settle disputes, 
and then they fail for centuries to appropriate it, to utilize it, to execute it at the most opportune times. And so we only have these scant weird examples that are proof texts that are actually hugely contentious examples. So to me, this is just super duper stretch, right? I mean, he has this power to guide and protect the church, but doesn't exercise it except for scant, ridiculous examples that are basically big scandals, but it's there to ground the church and protect it. it makes no sense. Yeah, and I would say that um, in, in, the, in regards to them making claims of Vatican I um, being exercised in the first millennium, um, they'll usually point to like the Tome of Leo or um, Pope Agatho's letter at Constantinople III, um, or the first version of the Libellus of Hormistos. But what's really interesting is in Bishop Gasser's interpretation of Pastor Eternos, Bishop Gasser was literally the bishop assigned by the Vatican to interpret Pastor Eternos. Like he was the official interpretation of Pastor Eternos. And he writes the only documented first millennium example of a pope exercising um, infallible autocratic authority that he points to is the second version of the libellus of Hormistos, not the first version, which is the one they always quote that Roman Catholics always use in their argumentation. The only one he lists is the second version. And so that what he's saying is that in Pastor Eternos, he's literally saying that all these examples that you guys are using, Tome of Leo, it's not an example. It's not an example of infallible authority. And mention that Gasser's Relatio is the official reading of Pastor Turner's, correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah, and you see there on the screen, I've got Ubi's essay where he explicitly makes the point that uh, Luigi just made, right? <clears throat> Which is that um, the original <clears throat> only lends itself to a pro-Vatican I understanding if you start from the presupposition of Vatican I being true. And it has not... <clears throat> been traditionally seen as a proof of infallibility in fact that uh gasser makes this uh, this very point <clears throat> now uh you did get into the two versions uh is it did you have any other comments on that because a lot of people in the audience I mean, that they may not be familiar with this could do you want to go into any detail about explaining well, what what this well, is sure i i what, what i can just say is this right so in the, the first version is the one that's usually referenced and the reason why they reference it is because it's signed by the Patriarch of Constantinople. Um, now, the Patriarch of Constantinople signs it with the caveat that Constantinople is with Rome, alongside Rome, in authority. So that's the only reason why the Patriarch of Constantinople signs it. But none of the other three patriarchs sign it. And then in the second version, none of the patriarchs sign it. Not one. Not even the Patriarch of Constantinople signs the second version. So... That, that was even less right. So if this is the only example that Roman Catholics can point to as a infallible decree, why is it that not one of the other patriarchs accepted it? Yeah, and, and I think, know, yeah, great point. If you went with the first version, it's only the patriarch of Constantinople that accepted it. The other three did not. Yeah, and I think you had uh, <laughs> some good examples. So basically we've got the move they try to make with Sardica. We pointed out uh, a, a second ago here that if we look at the way that uh, the Chieti document explains Sardica, it points out the appeals process is not for a unilateral uh, final word from the Pope. It's for an appeal for a retrial. It's a synodal move. Right. And then Rome even admits here that the Bishop of Rome was not exercising canonical authority over the churches of the East. So, in other words, the Sardican uh, uh, appellate structure is not a proof for universal supremacy and jurisdiction, according to Rome. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, let me just read this quote here on the topic of the formula. Because um, this, the, the, again, the first version is the one they always will go to, even though, like I just pointed out, that's not acknowledged by the Roman Catholic Church as an example of infallible decree. But I want to read this. this is from Edward Denny's Papalism. It says, the Greek found in the Acts of the Fourth Council of Constantinople, omits the greater part of the references to the Roman See, running as follows. The chief means of salvation is that we should keep the rule of right faith and in no way deviate from the decrees of God and the fathers. Then are omitted all the remaining words down to following in all things the ordinance of the fathers and the document proceeds at once with the anathemas and concludes conserving, concerning the most reverent patriarch Ignatius and those who think with him. 
Whatever the authority the apostolic throne has decreed, we embrace with our whole mind this profession of faith. Uh, so basically it's saying that the Greek, the Greek actually omits a large portion of what their whole argument is about the formula for mystos, um, which is the universal authority that it includes. And it's, it's completely omitted in the Greek. That's a really important part. And, and maybe we could, uh, if you don't want to go to this, we don't have to, but <clears throat> um, so much of this hinges on Sardica. It might be good if we just get the rest of Sardica out of the way, because sure. <clears throat> he talked about uh, what canons like three, four, five or something. You went to, uh, no, he, he said three, seven and eight. You went to a couple uh, of the canons and then talked about how tr what uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the point you made. I've got it in my my later notes, but I talked about canon three and nine. That's it. Three and nine. I have, I have right here. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah. So so uh, tell us first what he was arguing, Sardica wise, and then your responses from these canons. Right. He was so he was pointing out in canons four and five um, that Rome was being acknowledged as the first see. Um, that's really what is occurring here at Sardica is they're being acknowledged as the first C, the first among equals, which is the Eastern Orthodox position. Um, so it doesn't prove anything in regards to our position. But he was arguing that this demonstrates that there was a supreme authority of the Roman C. Um, and then I pointed out that in Canons 3 and 9, what it describes is what you already have uh, pointed out, that um, at Canons 3 and 9, it specifically says that the Roman C can be appealed to if neighboring bishops have already made a decision and you decide you don't like that decision, you can appeal to the Roman See, but the Roman See only decides whether or not there will be a retrial. And then if he determines there is a retrial, he sends the case to a neighboring province and he doesn't even get to attend. It specifically says he can send legates, but he can't, can't even attend the final appeal. So all he's doing is reviewing this appeal that already had a neighboring bishop make a decision on. He's determining whether or not it deserves a retrial, and then he's sending it to retrial. He so like you're pointing out, it's a synodal, it's a synodal model. It's not a it's not a universal um, immediate authority that's being exercised here. It's a it's a conciliar model that's occurring with accountability with the neighboring province. And I can, do you want me to just read the, I can read. Well, the, I've got it pulled up on the screen, but you can go ahead and read it. Yeah. Yeah. It's on the so screen. Read, so Canon three, but if perchance sentence be given against a bishop in any matter, and he supposes his case to be not unsound, but good in order that the question may be reopened, let us, if it seem good to your charity, honor the memory of Peter, the apostle, and let those who gave judgment write to Julius, the Bishop of Rome, so that if necessary, the case may be retried. Wait a minute. If necessary, the case may be retried by the bishops of the neighboring province and let him appoint arbiters. If it can be not, if it cannot be shown that his case is of such a sort as to need a new trial, let the judgment once be given, not be annulled, but stand as good as before. So in other words, the Pope can stick with the original decision. That's what it's saying at the end there. If, if he chooses, he can, he can decide that this case doesn't need a retrial the bishops of your province got this right. But if he decides, uh, no, I think they may have gotten it wrong, then he can send it to a neighboring province. And like it says, he can send arbiters, but he cannot attend. And then Canon 9 is similar. It says, but those who come to Rome ought, as I said before, to deliver our beloved brother and fellow bishop Julius the petitions which they have to give. And, and so... Giving him his own advocacy and care shall send them to the court. So that's that's canon nine. That last part on nine, can you repeat that? Because you you roboted for a second. Oh, yeah, I'll just read. It's short. But those who come to Rome ought, as I said before, to deliver to our beloved brother and fellow bishop, Julius, the petitions which they have to give, in order that he may first examine them, lest some of them should be improper. And so 
giving them his own advocacy and care shall send them to the court, which is a council. Yeah. So in other words, not the uh, autocratic model here. <clears throat> yes, that's great. Um, so, yeah, I think Sardica was a, a, a big, uh, yeah, I think he really thought that was going to be a kind of a kill shot, but ended up, I think, shooting him in the foot. Um, is there anything else you want to mention on Sardica? Now, there was one other point you did make about that uh, uh, Canon 35 of the Apostolic uh, Canons, right? Excuse me, 34, 35. The bishops of every nation must acknowledge him who is first among them and account him as their head and do nothing of consequence without his consent. But each may do those things only which concern his own parish. And the country places which belong to it, but neither let him who is the first do anything without the consent of all, for so there is unanimity. And that's of course the conciliar model. And then you tied this into uh, also the canons uh, of Sardica and them being accepted at Trollo. So you were making the point that Trollo and then Vat and then Nicaea too is affirming this uh, synodal model, correct? Yeah, and then. Um... Sorry, I got some my uh, my uh, battery's getting low. That's why it uh, I just plugged it in though, so we're good. That's why it was lagging. Um, but anyways, um, Ibarra in his review tried to say um, that this is in that canon Apostolic Canon thirty four is only in reference to the um, the first of the Metropolitan. So like in this context, it would have been like similar to like a patriarch, even though this was before the patriarchate. Um, and what I find ironic is. So even if we were to grant that, you're reading, <laughs> you're you're going to assume now that this doesn't apply to the first among the patriarchs. What? So if it applies to the first bishop in the Metropolitan, why wouldn't it apply to the first of the patriarchs? That doesn't even make well, sense. Well, I mean, but Alex made the very same type of move when he said that if a patriarch, if, if a uh, bishop has privileges within a synod and a patriarch has privileges within his jurisdiction then there has to be a super patriarch with privileges above all the patriarchs right which is a fallacious move to begin with because that it doesn't follow that because a patriarch has privileges that there has to be a super patriarch with super privileges <clears throat> yeah the first the first among equals is not a super bishop which is which is what my entire point in my opening statement was especially highlighting obviously the case of Vigilius. And this, like, I know we're going to get into this, but this is a point that you had alluded to earlier that is really important, is there were popes that thought they had more authority than they did. Exactly. And so, of course, you might be able to find a quote from a pope, you know, implying that he has that authority. What you need to look at is how did the church react to that quote? Not the quote of, uh, I'm sure yeah. he didn't think well, he had no authority. Yeah, and, and not just that, but also all of the, all of the canons in every ecumenical council Right. <clears throat> um, and Trollo as well, which isn't exactly ecumenical, but it's a, it's received at uh, Nicaea too. <clears throat> Every council, as we pointed out for many years, this is a classic article uh, written by one of our old school mods who went on there to become a deacon. Um, he might be becoming a priest. I'm not sure. But um, Seraphim Armad, um, uh, years ago, 2018 or 19, he made this big list of all the canons in the councils that actually conflict with the Vatican I mindset. And as we know, the response to the Roman Catholics, as uh, Alex said many times in the debate, well, uh, I don't care about all the canons because the Pope's above the canons. But the point is that <clears throat> the canons demonstrate the mindset of the entire church. So unless you just want to assume the Vatican I papal mindset and that the only thing that matters is the Roman bishop, well, maybe if the model is synodal, then that's going to shift to now we're concerned with the mindset of everybody. And if everybody's mindset at the at the councils is enacting all these canons that conflict with Vatican I in every ecumenical council, then maybe <coughs> Vatican I is not the mindset of the ancient church. Maybe Vatican I is a temptation mindset of the Roman bishop at times, you see. That's two different yeah. models. <clears throat> yeah, and he... For some reason, he asked me for a canon in an ecumenical council that shows Constantinople had appellate authority. And I was kind of like shocked at this question because canons 9 and 17, I said of Constantinople 1, I was wrong. It's canons 9 and 17 of, of Chalcedon. I misspoke. But they, they grant Constantinople appellate authority. And, he, and, he, and then he was trying to say that um, 
he was asking me if 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 it what it meant was that the authority was the same as as Rome. Well, Canon 20, and that's when we started talking about Canon 28. Canon 28 says it uses the word privileges. It says all the privileges that apply to Rome apply to New Rome. And then in his refutation of, of, of Canon 28, he was he was desperately trying to prove papal supremacy. And what he the point that he made was that Leo rejected Chalcedon on Canon 28, but then another pope later on accepted it. So in his desperate attempt to try to prove papal supremacy, he just refuted their whole talking point that a pope can't change sacred tradition. Let's say I well, <clears throat> well, but then he then he uh, backtracked on what counts as sacred tradition by appealing to the ambiguous terminology of quote faith and morals, which accordingly to him only applies to divine revelation. So <clears throat> uh, first of all, what's binding is not restricted to quote just faith and morals. Uh, you're also bound by the the decisions of the Roman See and the Roman Congregation, uh, whether you deem them to be faith and morals or not. So you're bound by much more than just some ambiguous thing of quote faith and morals. You're bound by, as Vatican I says, all the extraordinary and universal ordinary and the ordinary teaching, which even though it might be fallible, you must submit to with docility. So you're bound by a lot more than just a generic idea of faith and morals, because that allowed him, as you're pointing out in the debate, to say. Well, the Pope can just sort of toss out and then retroactively go back and say, well, that council, that canon is good now. And then uh, by uh, 869 or whatever, they can say, OK, now we do accept uh, Constantinople as new Rome. So the very thing that he was saying that Leo was rejecting Canon 28 of Chalcedon because of papalism, that's not even the reason that Leo rejects it. Leo rejects it because he thinks it does violence to the canonical structure of Canon 6 of Nicaea. And he explicitly says that. It's not an appeal to papalism. He says it's not fair to Alexandria to move uh, Constantinople ahead of it. So, <clears throat> but it doesn't matter because eventually by what, like 869 or somewhere in there, uh, right, the Roman Catholic version of the, the Eighth Ecumenical Council, they do accept it. Well, and that's what I'm getting at is, so if a pope can change a canon of an ecumenical council, I don't even know what Roman Catholics mean when they say that a pope can't change sacred tradition. There's nothing more sacred about uh, there's nothing more sacred in tradition than an ecumenical canon, except for scripture itself. That's the most sacred tradition you other than maybe the liturgy, which he also changes. So I, I don't even know what Roman Catholics mean when they. Well, say I that. think that what they end up meaning by that is that really tradition is the pope. And the Pope right. is the tradition. And that's what right. Vatican, that's that's what Dolinger said Vatican I would do to the Roman Catholic Church. That's exactly what it does. I mean, Pope Pius IX explicitly says, I am tradition, I am the church. So, I mean, like, so this, this it's, it's just a meaningless talking point when they say that a Pope can't change sacred tradition. Yeah, well, I, I have a clip I want to play on that because, uh, and of course, uh, you know, Tim's our friend, but I think that what Tim said in this new uh, popular documentary, particularly at this point right here, illustrates the very point that uh, Luigi just made. So let's listen to what Tim says as the Roman Catholics in this documentary are struggling with whether Francis has the authority <clears throat> to change the rite, to change the liturgy. Can he update the Latin mass to be the Novus Ordo vernacular, et cetera, et cetera, under two kinds receiving, you know, can, can he do that? Well, First, a bishop comes on, and so let's see what he thinks, and then we'll see what Tim Gordon says about what the nature and extent of papal supremacy is. And that supreme authority is subordinated to the Word of God, Scripture, and tradition, including liturgical tradition. Do you think the Pope can say the Latin Mass is completely forbidden? Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> I love that that bishop's like, mm, eh, I don't know. I think he can do that. I mean, I think, you know, as a supreme pontiff, I think he has the power to do that. All over the world, it would cause unnecessary uh, harm. Vatican I, it says some clearish things about papal authority, but I don't know what it means to be supreme and yet not unlimited until you give me hypos to, to test cases to say, well, can the Pope say four persons in the Trinity? Well, then how come Vatican I didn't give all the hypothetical test cases? Like, wh why is Vatican I not good enough? I thought the point of dogmatic definitions was to make it clear what the thing in question really was, to settle the issue. 
But now, basically, that's nah, not really clear. We got to have all these hypotheticals to know. Uh, can Francis tell us that uh, I have to sell my backyard to the Vatican? Can Francis tell me that I have to believe in four persons of the Trinity? Right? It becomes all these. Basically, the definition is then useless because now it's not telling me anything unless I have an infinite series of uh, hypotheticals to apply to it. Can the Pope say that every practicing Catholic must attend at least two NBA games per season? Folks need to get hip to the idea that papal authority has not been laid out yet. I, But I thought Vatican I laid it out. Like, what? What do you mean? This is... I mean, I love Tim, but I, this is, I just don't get that. <clears throat> anyway, yeah, go ahead. And, well, um, I was going to say, so I think that uh, we are often criticized uh, in East Orthodox Church for not having um, all these little doctrines worked out. Like, why isn't there why isn't there a magisterium that that's uh, established our doctrine on contraception? Yeah, you know, and, and like this is you know this is what's often criticized in the Orthodox Church. But then what ends up happening is in the Roman Catholic Church, you have all these documents that just end up contradicting one another. I mean, there is no there is no way to reconcile Vatican II with Florence. There is no way. No shot. Um, and so that's what occurs. That's what occurs when you attempt to define every little thing and put it in doctrine yeah. is you end up contradicting yourself. Well, and there's a noticeable <clears throat> transition to, I think, you know, I mentioned earlier, uh, Dictatus Pape, because Dictatus yes. Pape comes in the 11th century, right when we get this crucial shift <clears throat> in what the church understands itself to be between East and West. So right when the schism's happening, <clears throat> right before the schism, we're already seeing two divergent models and understandings of what <clears throat> the church is, what ecclesiology is. And part of it is due to what we're talking about tonight, which is that it is, I think, a seed. It's a seed that's growing in the Latin church, unfortunately, that's turning into a worldly geopolitical organization. And the new Papadakis Meyendorf book is great on that because it's treating specifically this period of uh, 1071 to 1453 <clears throat> and how the two, East and West, the two, the two sides, so to speak, of the church, how they there diverge. And it's in the West that you start getting at this very point, Dictatus Pape, all the outlandish claims, all of the new ecclesiology, where if you look at the canons here, you'll notice the canons talk about uh, let a bishop be ordained by two or three bishops. It doesn't say the Bishop of Rome confirms every bishop in the world. Yet by the time of the Gregorian reforms and after, we get the new model of ecclesiology, which is a revolution. Eastern Catholics call it a revolution. Congar, uh, he's not Eastern Catholic, he's Dominican, but in his book, uh, 900 Years Together, he, says, he talks about a revolution. Phocian Schism, Adornic calls it a revolution. Uh, any, any treatise of the Gregorian period calls it an ecclesiological revolution. Why? Because the seeds of what Luigi's talking about are coming to fruition. So I actually do think it is an evolving doctrine. Newman is correct. And that's really the only way to make sense of this. It's certainly not the case uh, all that it's always there from the earliest days, a la, you know, Leo the Thirteenth. Well, and and female priests was in seed form with all those female deaconesses, you know, that were baptizing people. So that was in seed form. So now we can now we can just have female priests because they're yeah. It's weird, but yeah, this is a great point because uh, I remember when I was a trad cat, I always felt like. The, the papacy was the bastion of uh, tradition, the conservative institution that would protect tradition. And then I, I started realizing <clears throat> that maybe the papacy, uh, a la the critique of Papadakis, uh, 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 Welton, uh, Meyendorf, and others, what if it's the revolutionary institution that innovates, that then prepares for revolutions that don't have to go in a conservative direction? In other words, can the seed not grow into a liberal form? As the point, which is the point you're making. I mean, there's nothing about this that necessitates that it's only going to be a seed that grows into some trad thing. Why can't this? Yeah, exactly. Why can't deaconesses become the seed for female priests and bishops? Yeah, exactly. All right. <clears throat> Sorry, we're, I got way off course there. Let's get back to the debate. So, um, let's see. We covered uh, Gaster's Reladio. We covered uh, the formula for Mizdus. Um, the, the next thing I noticed that he was doing was uh, he, he hinged the whole argument on the tone. There was a lot of papal letters written with a tone of authority and magisterial we. Okay, so what? Doesn't prove Vatican I. Uh, many people at this time wrote in a flowery, 
prose, prose that you know might suggest all kinds of things, but it doesn't prove Vatican won. So a lot of moves were made that you know it's it's always a stretch. It's like it's like let me pull together all these stretchy things and stretch them into this. And man, can you kind of see a little bit of Vatican one in there? To me, that just is just a big fail. Yeah, and I mean, I point this out um, in in my rebuttals. I think I I went too fast through it, um, but Saint Cyril um, distributes his five tomes against Nestorius before ever even talking to the See of Rome. So they love to go to they love to go to his letter where he writes to the See of Rome regarding excommunication. Um, before he does that, he distributes his five tomes telling Nestorius he's a heretic. So he didn't need to, he didn't need a right to the See of Rome to do that. He knew that Nestorius was a heretic and he distributes those tomes to the churches. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I was trying to, I was trying to unmute. I had to, oh, okay. I had to click over to unmute. Um, <clears throat> yeah, did you, is there anything you wanted to say about uh, prosaic language or the, or the tone, the quote, the tone argument? I also noted that at that point he said something like, like he cited two sources, and it was like two Roman Roman Catholic priests. <laughs> like, like imagine going to if we were debating it, you know, and all we were doing was citing like Orthodox sources. I mean, he to be fair, he did pull in I think Schmiemann. So they, they always go to like one Orthodox source. It's always Schmiemann or Ware. That's like the only Orthodox people they look to. But guys, you, you guys should read some. Uh, I mean, I'll take that back. Oh, I remember now. Sashensky. He did cite Shashensky, uh, and it's about Leo. And that's important because there's something that was missing here. Because when he cited Leo, or uh, no, I'm sorry, it was about uh, Gregory. Yes. So here's the quote that he gave about Pope St. Gregory. He says, Gregory provides a model, uh, modern, wait, Gregory thus provides modern ecumenical discussion on the papacy with a two-edged sword. For on the one hand, there's no doubt that he defined the primacy of Rome vigorously and grounded the preeminence in his sees Petrine origin rather than any conciliar decisions. So he stopped the quote there, giving the impression that Pope St. Gregory the Great taught, quote, Vatican I ideas. However, if you read on, it notes that, first of all, primacy doesn't equal Vatican I. So the primacy can be in both models. Okay, So just stopping the quote where it says by a, by a Sashensky that Gregory the Great believed in, quote, Roman primacy, that doesn't mean Vatican I. That's the thing that's in question. And if you go on, he says, <clears throat> quote, although he recognized the canons of Constantinople, oops, <clears throat> and even admitted the existence of the Pentarchy, oops, he didn't appeal to it as an authority. So there's an admission of that structure as well, even though Gregory's not appealing to it. But that doesn't prove Vatican I. I mean, Gregory the Great is probably the last quote that a Roman Catholic wants to quote. Yeah, and I, I, we're going to go to the, Let me give one more quote uh, because the ne he, he didn't read the rest of the paragraph because the next paragraph says, according to Meindorf, however... Gregory stressed the Petrine uh, Episcopal power did not consider this power was communicated through Rome only. He is therefore a major witness to what's called an ecclesiology of communion, which kept East and West together in the first millennium of Christian history. His writings against the title of universal patriarch affirm the rights of all the individual bishops against a singular universalist claim, even of the Bishop of Rome. So yeah. had he read on, he would have realized that, no, the full context of that quote is not admitting that Gregory the Great's a Vatican I proponent. The full context of the quote admits that he's not that. Yeah, I mean, this is straight from, from, from Gregory the Great, and uh, he writes in Book 5. He says, For he himself, Peter, exalted the sea in which he designed, or uh, reigned even to rest and end the present life, Rome. He himself adorned the sea to which he set his disciple as evangelist, Alexandria. He himself established the sea in which, though he was to leave it, he sat for seven years, Antioch. Since then, it is the sea of one and one sea, over which by divine authority three bishops now preside. Whatever good I hear of you, this I impute to myself. 
So <laughs> this is the last person that. Yeah, and, and that's a great point. And I have it on screen because, of course, that's the famous uh, three Petrine C's quote from uh, Gregory the Great. You can see its source there in Father John's uh, article. And then I'll link it uh, in the chat for you guys right there if you want to go read the, the rest of it to see. We're not making it up. You guys are making it up. Um, yeah, and, then, go ahead. and then Roman Catholic will counter this and say that, um, well, Peter died in Rome. And it's like, okay, why does that, why is that significant? Like, can you tell me what, like, just the fact that he died in Rome, is that, that's what makes it significant? Okay, he founded Antioch first. I could equally say that he founded Antioch first. Yeah, and they'll say, well, but he consecrated it with his blood and his martyrdom. And it's like, okay, but where do we, does anybody appeal to that? Uh, how early do we get that appeal? Right. In other words, if that's what makes the Roman See unique contra uh, Alexandria or Antioch, why is that a very late appeal? Right. But yeah, I just, again, I, I encourage people if you do uh, want to get the Sashinsky book, I highly recommend it because even though he did cite uh, one sentence from it, probably getting it from uh, Ibarra, the, the, the whole chapter uh, on. Rome in the first uh, 700 years, chapter 4, it doesn't back up the Vatican I view at all. <laughs> There's nothing in it that backs up the Vatican I view. In fact, everything in that chapter is basically admitting that, you know, look, can't, a lot of these classic proof texts just don't work, and they're bad arguments. So it's a great book to make that point, in fact. Um, where do you want to go next? Um... Not sure. So uh, let's see here. Pull my notes. Um, Did you want to mention anything have... about? Uh, you mentioned something. I don't remember how you phrased it, but you were talking about um, head uh, uh, preeminent. Um, I think. Oh you... yes. <laughs> yeah. So they were um, in their review. They were saying that I miss I misused the term inviolable. Um, and I, I find that interesting. So I actually tried to reach out to father, uh, Richard price on this because he actually misquotes in, uh, in acts of Ephesus. And I was talking with, um, Ubi Petrus about this as well, um, because we were trying to figure out the Greek word used here, um, for inviolable. Um, but he actually misquotes the in his citation so we, we tried to reach out to him to figure out what the greek word used for inviolable was here but i mean the, the definition of inviolable is never to be broken or infringed <laughs> like what well, that's what and that's what i said i said we'll never err the, the we'll never err the the seat of the the seat of the emperor <laughs> well that is inviolable that's what the quotation says i can read the actual quotation here uh let me find it but I found it interesting that in their review that they were that they were going after um, going after my use of that word as if I used it erroneously. What do you? Th I mean, inviolable. That's what inviolable means, is it not? Yeah, I mean, uh, there were several examples like this where um, term words and phrases are used. I, th I thought you had some good ones. I didn't know that. I had not heard that uh, quote about the Holy Spirit has dictated to the imperial pen. Uh, oh, yeah. no, wait a minute. So now is the emperor uh, in inspired and infallible in the Roman Catholic view? Um, the the use of Matthew 16 for Constantinople, uh, that was something I not I not heard that. So do you want to go into some of those things? And then we'll get into the, I thought your Vigilius uh, points on the Constitutum, the two versions of the Constitutum were really strong points as well. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, this is the quotation here where the emperor is called the divine and inviol inviolable head. It's a, it's a, this is from Price's Acts of Ephesus, page 308, um, which again, citation is wrong, but, but he's quoting the council. Um, Nor does my devotion suppose that any of the most devout bishops are unaware that not merely once or twice, but even more frequently on the matter for the instructions from the divine and inviolable head. So that's in reference to the emperor. So when they, when they pull a quote, about um, the the papacy being referred to as the head, it's not an issue. Like we, like it's amazing how many Roman Catholics haven't even heard of the Byzantine two-headed eagle, like right. the emperor and the pope. Like, um, and so uh, 
Yeah, and then uh, you brought up the my quotation from Matthew 16 being applied to the em empire of Constantine. Um, and so this is my issue with with all of their with all of their talking points. They boil down to these quotations have to be taken literally, and they have to mean the same thing from now until the end of ages. They only mean the Vatican I support is basically what it amounts to. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a selective use of the text to fit the Vatican I model retroactively. It's a revisionist move. Um, let's get to the uh, uh, Vigilius examples. Explain what's going on at the Fifth Council. By the way, Sashinsky has a great treatment of uh, Vigilius in the Fifth Council as well in Chapter 4. So tell us kind of what's going on here, how he was kind of... Uh, forced to kind of to bend to the will of the emperor and the council, and why we have why we have two versions of this uh, this letter from him. Yeah, um, real quick, um, I just want to read this quote here. Oh yeah, sure. From, um, this is on page fifty of the book Papal Primacy. Um, and this is the one that you referenced, where uh, the emperor is uh, Matthew sixteen is applied to the emperor, but yeah, it says, and with the Almighty who rules with you, O most devout emperor. You decide because you are appointed by God. Rejoice, O city of Zion, summit of the, worth, the world, and the empire. Constantine ornamented you with purple and crowned you with faith, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against your orthodox empire. I mean, that's literally like exactly the type of quote that they use to support Pope Agatho's letter. When they yeah, talk about the seal, never yeah, heard. and and I, I can't believe that he thought you were actually arguing that the emperor was infallible. I mean, that was so silly. Like, now obviously, that's not what he's arguing. He's making the point that these phrases and this this prosaic, uh, uh, flowery language doesn't always lend to the uh, easy, you know, knockdown proof text that we might want it to be because the context, the 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 referent, the uh, the limitations on the use of this kind of stuff, and the and the common uh, usage of these kinds of things at that time, um, again, it's just, it doesn't work because there's so many examples of this, right? So in other words, it's inconsistent. So again, it's like Basil when he says that uh, Melidios is the head of the churches and the, the, the whole body descends from the head. It's like, oh, does that mean he's the Pope now? Or he's, oh, but no, but he's not Rome. Yeah, exactly. So, but it, so it's a selective, um, it's, it's a, it's a double standard is what I'm trying to say, where it only works when it works to prove the Vatican I view. Any contrary evidence doesn't count. It's the exact same thing that Muslims do when you talk about the contradictions in the Quran appealing to prior revelation, and yet prior revelation is full of contradictions. And you ask the Muslim, okay, but what's the principle by which I know the prior revelations to be true and false? Well, it's the ones that agree with the Quran. But the Quran tells me to check the Quran against prior revelation. But now you're saying that prior revelation is contradictory. Yeah, but it's not contradictory when you read it in light of the Quran. They're doing the exact same move. Vatican I is proven via proof texts that I find in church history that support Vatican I. The same model, the same move, when it's not conducive to Vatican I, we throw that one out. It doesn't count. It's arbitrary. Yeah. Uh, and then you asked about... Um... Constantinople II. So uh, you asked me to explain Constantinople II. Yeah. So uh, essentially what, what kind of triggered Constantinople II was Pope Vigilius had released what's called the Judicatum, which by the way, in the debate, he kept, he kept using the wrong term. So there was three total documents that were released. The first one was called the Judicatum, which was two years prior to Constantinople II. And what this did is it, it sort of uh, subtly condemned the authors of what's called the three chapters, which had Nestorian tendencies. Um, it subtly condemned them, but then two years later, after he releases the Judicatum, he retracts it. And this is what triggers the council. Emperor Justinian then calls the council, um, and Vigilius was fine with a council occurring, but he wanted it to occur in the West. And so because it didn't occur in the West, it occurred in Constantinople, he didn't even attend it. Instead, he wrote um, what's called the Constitutu, his first constitutum, constitutum, um, just means constitution. He wrote the, his first version of it. And in this version of it, um, he accepts that the authors of the three chapters were Orthodox. 
So he's he's first he subtly condemned in the judicatum. Then he retracts it. Then he comes forward and he says, actually, uh, not only was I wrong by that judicatum, but these authors are actually orthodox. And then at the end of that first constitutum, he says this. We ordain and decree that it be permitted to no one to write or bring forth anything contradictory to the contents of this constitutum or after this declaration begin a new controversy about them. And if anything has already been done in contradiction of this, our ordinance, this we declare void by the authority of the apostolic see. So he, he, he gives the council his constitutum and he says, this is the papal decree. I mean, it couldn't be more clear. He literally says it's by the authority of the apostolic see. And then the point that I really needed Alex to, to I needed to hear out of his mouth because the council responds. They say there's no other way to resolve conflict, resolve questions of faith and morals than in a council. And it specifically says in their letter back to the, back to Pope Vigilius that even the apostles, even though all the apostles were infallible, it says, they had to meet in a council in Acts 15. It references Acts 15. And it says, you do not have the authority to assert this apostolic see over us because the council is how these things are determined. That's literally what they say in their letter back to him. So this is, again, conciliarism yes. all the way back from the earliest days of the church. You mentioned uh, canons from an early Antioch, Synod of Antioch. We see it in the Apostolic Canons 34 30, slash 35. We fast forward through the canons of the councils up to the Fifth Ecumenical Council. Few people know about this. And you're pointing out that their letter back to him is, is that we don't accept the unilateral autocratic model. The only way that we understand the acceptance, or excuse me, the uh, resolution to these issues is synodally. Right. And then I asked him, so everyone that's watching this, you, the Roman Catholic position is that the bishops were wrong about that. That when they say there's no other way that the truth can be made manifest except for any conciliar model, that's what the bishops say back to Vigilius. And you need to make the Roman Catholics say the bishops of this ecumenical council in their final uh, declaration were wrong. You have to make that come out of their mouth. And I did it in the debate. Um, the, and this is, I mean, at what point are you just not the church of the first millennium? Yeah, so exactly. Just, and that was what the debate was, right? The premise was, yeah. is the church of the first thousand years, the Vatican I papal model or the Orthodox uh, synodal uh, conciliar model? Yeah. So, so then, after the council, which, by the way, um, as far as all the evidence is concerned, um, was received as ecumenical. In fact, uh, when Nicaea II, and I read these full quotations in the debate, I can do it now if you want me to, but in Nicaea II, they reference Constantinople II, and they say it was ecumenical, and they say it was by the affirmation of the four patriarchs. They don't even mention Vigilius. So it was seen as fully valid, as fully ecumenical with the, with the affir affirmation of the four patriarchs. And then finally, two years later, after the council, Vigilius submits to the, the council and he agrees that the writers of the three chapters were indeed heretics. So, and we see this again and again. And this is my question for a Roman Catholic. If you is there any example where there was a conflict between the consent of the church and the Roman see and the Roman see came out on top? Is there any example where the entire consent of the church said, we're wrong, we're going to submit to you the Roman see? Because I just showed you an example, and there's many examples like this, where the Pope tries to assert his authority as the Roman see, as the apostolic see, and what ends up happening is he submits to the consent of the church, which is why the orthodox position is stronger because our evidence is what actually happened, not some quote mine of Pope Agatha's letter. We have an actual, how it actually went down demonstrates that the consent of the church is a higher authority than a papal decree. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I mean, I want to look and see if uh, if this quote is... 
still there on their on Which their one? channel or not. So I've I've saved it. So again, let's Why remember the bishops remember the Chalcedon feel they needed to judge Theodora if Leo had already reinstated him. Well, um, they didn't they didn't recognize Roman jurisdiction in the eastern provinces. There you go. So uh, I just wanted to play that again. Um, yeah, that's great. Thank you. That's really, really strong point there on uh, Vigilius and the Fifth Council. Um, do you want to move on or, or stay? Anything else you want to say on that? Uh, I'm looking at Sardic and Cannons. We've done that. Now, yeah. what I, one thing he know, one thing he know, he said that I noticed is that if you go to Sardica, he says seven and eight uh, prove papalism, or he said something like that. But when you go and read seven and eight, I don't know where he's he didn't flesh out this this point. He just kind of said it in passing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what he's talking about in seven and eight proving papalism, because when I read seven and eight, like it talks about. What shall be granted by the emperor in Canon 8 of Sardica? So I don't know what he's talking about that this proves papalism. That I didn't get that. Yeah, well, and who is just on, on Constantinople 2, just real quick before we move on. Yeah, he yeah. was missing my point um, about, the, about the, uh, the contents of the constitutum. He was trying to focus on the fact that he was trying to argue that the contents of the constitutum were, were orthodox in both cases which I think I demonstrate was not true because in one case he affirms the orthodoxy of the three writers and the other case he doesn't. So that's a contradiction, but he's missing my, the overarching point about Constantinople too, is that the bishops in their response are saying there's no other way to resolve matters of faith. So whether or not the constitutum is orthodox, which I demonstrate it's not, but let's say I grant that it is their response back to him saying that you can't assert this authority over us is is the is the stronger point here that I was trying to make with 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 Constantinople too. And I think that kind of I don't know if we were talking past each other with that, but I think that kind of went over um his head a little bit. Yeah, and I don't want to get off track. I apologize. I, I just didn't understand what he was trying to argue with Canon seven and eight of of Sarka. Because oh, no in the by the time you're getting into the cross examinations um, it starts to get into these, you guys kind of are firing back and forth on different points. And he says something about, well, I think you misunderstood seven and eight of Sardica actually, uh, prove papacy. But then when we look at seven and eight, it talks about that the bishops, uh, we don't want bishops going to the secular court. Uh, even if the emperor summons them, I mean, it's I, nothing here to do with pap pap papalism. I don't, I don't get it. Do you know what he was trying to argue? I have, I have no, no clue. clue. Okay. No, I mean, he didn't flesh it out. He mentioned it. He said to you, I, well, Car S Sardica uh, 7 and 8 proved my view. And then I'm reading it, and I'm like, I don't see where he's getting any of that. Yeah, I mean, even even in Barra admits that Sardica is just Rome as a review court, you know, for appeals that are being made. So I'm not really sure why. I mean, I don't think educated Roman Catholics argue from Sardica, as far as I know. Exactly. And... Uh, the next uh, big mistake was where he says, <clears throat> I liked your question about the forgeries, and I thought he had a huge fail here if we think about it, because he basically argued that the, the church is not infallible in terms of, quote, facts, but it is infallible in terms of faith and morals. He says, so even if the church cited a forgery to back up something in a, in, a, in a decree or dogma, the dogma is protected. Even if it cites a false fact, I mean, this is crazy. I, this blows my mind because now basically the papacy is the living embodiment of epistemological truth itself. So basically if the papacy utilizes false forgery facts, the facts can be wrong, but the truth is still protected by the Holy Spirit, he says that papalism is proven prior to the forgeries. Well, first of all, he didn't demonstrate yet that Vatican I actually is prior to the forgeries. And the Catechism of Council Trent, for example, still relied on forgeries to prop up papacy. Um, I mean, I think Rome is, 
uh, no one judges the first C is still in Roman Catholic canon law, and that's based on a forgery. So <laughs> just this, just this idea that the dogma is protected, even though it's citing or referencing a forgery, and a fact can be a fact can be wrong, but the dogma can still be true. That to me, that's crazy. That's ridiculous. And by the way, these are actually not as clear cut as I think he wants them to be, because he wanted there to be this really clear cut distinction between something that's faith and morals. Uh, and dogma versus things that are facts or, quote, human traditions, he said. Uh, now, where in Roman Catholic dogma do we actually have the list of the things that are faith and morals and are not? Well, there's not one. There's criteria that every individual Catholic has to then suss out, supposedly, what goes into what bin. But now the epistemological problem, the criterion problem, it's all still there because we don't actually know if we're doing it right. How do I know just on the basis of generic criteria that, well, it's what the church has always taught and it's what the Roman see has dogmatically taught. Well, how do I know that in these mountains of papal documents, I'm actually sussing out and putting things in the right bin. And so every time they appeal to faith and morals and not to human traditions and what the faith and morals is super broad. Okay. And as you pointed out, yeah, I mean, why would Canon 28 not in some way relate to faith and morals? Why would, liturgical rites and disciplines not relate to faith and morals saying faith and morals could literally encompass anything potentially do you see do you see what i'm saying like these these basic super elastic terms that the pope is only infallible in faith and morals allows them the elasticity to bend and stretch and throw out when it doesn't work so if something seems to contradict it's not it's not infallible not faith and morals now wait a minute isn't death penalty related to faith and morals? Seems like morals to me. It's an ethical, moral question as to whether we should have the death penalty, right? Blessing a homosexual union. To me, that seems like it's a moral question. So how, and, and so there's, a, there's no clear divide between faith and morals. And I'm not saying that there might not be distinctions between things that are faith and morals and things that are not. But what I'm saying is that they don't give an actual clear epistemic criteria to know when it's what. Yeah. Um, so as far as your point about referencing my question on the um, forgeries, I, I really just think it's 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 ironic, you know, that on the eve of the schism, like the document that was used to justify this supreme authority in regards to uh, the use of leavened bread um, was the forgery. So so the pope isn't referencing Agatha's letter. He's not referencing a quotation by St. Maximus talking about how you have to be in communion with Rome. He's referencing the donation of Constantine, a forgery. There's irony there, right? There's an irony that at the schism, that's the document that got that was referenced as justification for the supreme authority, which I point this out. And I think that kind of went over his head during my uh, questioning on this. Well, and let's keep in mind that not too long after the schism, we immediately get the infamous Dictatus Pape uh, of Pope Gregory <clears throat> uh, the Seventh, and this is listed in his uh, register. It's also uh, it's mentioned by Meindorf. It's mentioned in the Sashinsky book. The scholarship basically says, yes, this is a real papal teaching, a real papal document. It's not fake. <laughs> I mean, they're using the forgeries. This is not a forgery. Uh, and <laughs> it has all these outlandish claims, which Nobody in the first thousand years of Christianity who is serious at all would believe or think that these outlandish claims have any basis in uh, the first millennium. I mean, they're just outlandish. And uh, we've, we've referenced the Dictatus Papi a million times, but I'm just pointing it out because there's a whole section in the Sashinsky book. There's a whole section in the Papadakis book. There you can see <laughs> all the infamous claims of <clears throat> uh, of Dictatus Papi. And this is, this is, again, right after. So we're talking right after the schism, what the authors call, <laughs> the scholars call the revolution in ecclesiology. This is it right here. And this is relying in some of these uh, propositions on forgeries. <clears throat> so it's not just forgeries to back up the papal claims, which he argued, well, there's already proofs of the papal claims. We didn't really need the, for what, then why'd you need the forgeries if there's already proofs? He said there was already proofs. Okay, then why do we need the forgeries? Well, they were mistakes and people were corrupt or something like that. But the, but the positions are still true. Oh, really? The positions. So the positions of Dictatus Papi are still true? Where it says that 
the Pope is the Quetzalcoatlrock, the God Emperor of all the universe. I mean, literally, that's what it says. It's like the the craziest, outlandish claims for a cleric. And and I mean, anybody who's read the uh, uh, Canons of the Councils, I mean, we just read which which what was one of these talking about how um, bishops uh, shouldn't have anything to do with secular courts because they'll come under uh, the censorship of the canons, like how bishops are not supposed to be involved in secular affairs. Oh, but wait a minute. Actually, the Pope is the supreme king of all secular affairs. Okay, this violates canons even back to Chalcedon. Chalcedon has canons about, about how clerics cannot be involved in affairs of state. At least they're not supposed to. And has that been abused? Yeah, I'm sure it was abused in the East as well. I'm sure people didn't follow that canon. But the point is that how can the head of the church change all of that to then take on a geopolitical role, which the canons that we just saw in Sardica mentioned censorship for. It's crazy. So wait a minute, are Sardican canons good or not? <laughs> right? So, I mean, if the canons of Sardica say that you shouldn't be involved in secular affairs, and now uh, Dictatus Papi says you're the Quisatus Hatterach, I mean, this is a contradiction. Right. And I would say Dictatus Pape, um, I mean, it's mini Vatican I um, for many people that aren't like familiar with the document. It's a lot of the same concepts that we see uh, at Vatican I in Pastor Eternos. Um, but what I find interesting about Dictatus Pape is, and Vatican I, is there's no way to reconcile that with Apostolic Canon 34. So if we look at like the earliest attestation, right, to... Um, to how ecclesiological matters are to be handled is consent. The first C must get the consent of all. This is the polar opposite of what Vatican I states. It's the literal inverse. It literally says the authority is irreformable of itself and not from the consent of the church. <laughs> it's the inverse of Apostolic Canon 34, the oldest attestation we have to uh, ecclesiological matters. So people ask, why is it such a big deal? You know, what, what did Rome do that was so bad? Read Dictatus Pape after reading the apostolic canons. <laughs> and there's actually significant. Well, and, and, for, and by the way, for everybody that's super lazy, I put both of them on the screen for you. So you don't even have to go read them. There's the canon right there. And I just had Dictatus Pape up for you for the last like 10 minutes. So there you go. Go ahead. Uh, I lost my train of thought now. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean oh, no, wait. I remember. I remember. I remember. Uh, it's so, so Swan Sona will argue uh, for apostolic succession and he'll point out that um, the priesthood, uh, the Levitical priesthood, would be um, ordained by two or three priests, which is exactly what the apostolic canons say. It's exactly what Nicaea 1 says about how a bishop is to be ordained. And you made this point earlier. But guess what? What does two or three sound like? Well, it's Trinitarian. Yeah. That's that's like the Trinity is is literally a model for how we conduct things in the church. And so when we see two or three witnesses that are ordaining the priest in the Levitical priesthood, and then we see the same thing being echoed in uh the church. There's continuity there with the Levitical priesthood, and it's a Trinitarian model of ordaining a bishop. So, yes, great point. And uh, I do have on the screen um, Canon 1 that you can see there where it says, uh, Let a bishop be ordained by two or three bishops. Note, contemporary Roman Catholic teaching is that the Pope is to be ordained, is to ordain all bishops. Uh, bishops are be, to be confined to their jurisdictions. Um, bishops must acknowledge who is first. That's Canon 34 there. Um, let a bishop not go beyond his limits, Canon 35, right? No bishop, bishops are to be uh, ordained within their jurisdiction. There's no exemptions. There's no exceptions ever made for the Pope. And Ibarra and all these people that always say, well, it's an argument from silence. They all knew it. So they didn't have to talk about it because everybody understood it. Oh, everybody understood it, but they're also enacting all these canons that contradict it. So which one is it? They understood it, and it was they were silent on it, or they were contradicting papal authority by 
pushing all these canons that contradict it throughout all these centuries. I mean, it's, it's, they just constantly flip flop on what their explanations are, which their explanations contradict is the point. Um, <clears throat> so did you <clears throat> want to uh, move on to anything else that you thought really stood out? I think the big, the biggest error that he made was when he said, and uh, I did save the clip, uh, I can pull it up oh, here in a second, gosh, but he says story, that Nestorius is not a heretic. I thought this was crazy. Um, and if you've read the McGucken book, if you've read Cyril extensively, if, if you're familiar with the teaching of Ephesus, then um, you know that this is just a huge uh, red flag. I mean, this is just sad. In matters of faith and morals, in the same way that when the Council of Ephesus uh, condemned uh, Nestorius as a heretic, we know now, looking back, that the Council was actually incorrect. It turns out that Nestorius wasn't a Nestorian. <laughs> so he doesn't even understand that it's not like Ephesus stands alone, because subsequent ecumenical councils also reaffirm all the condemnations of the heretics prior. So later ecumenical councils and their confessions will say, we condemn Nestorius, the God-hated Nestorius. We condemn Arius, right? They'll repeat the previous condemnations. And you get, he says after this that Honorius also was a heretic, but he doesn't seem to be aware that three ecumenical councils reaffirm that Honorius was a heretic. It's not just the, the, uh, the sixth, it's the sixth, the seventh, and then it's restated again in the synodical and in, uh, in later councils as well. So you got reaffirmations <clears throat> of of heretics being condemned. There is no absolutely no I, this, I don't know where they get this other than the ecumenist move that the papacy's done to now say that you can do the liturgy of Mar Nestorius and you can uh, you can uh, reverence Nestorius. This is a complete rejection of Ephesus. I mean this is just crazy. Uh to me it's mind blowing. I mean th this alone should be enough to tell people that this is not the true church. They will literally rewrite history for the sake of the papacy. The papacy is the epistemic principle of truth, of metaphysics, of reality. It changes the past now. This is crazy. I'm done with my rant. <laughs> I don't got nothing else to add to that. I mean, do you agree? Or I mean, do you, don't you think it's crazy to say that Nestorius is not a heretic? I mean, I, I, I tweeted out after kind of a, a little jab. I was like, uh, you know, <laughs> part one of, of stayings that shouldn't be controversial, but apparently are Nestorius was a heretic. <laughs> like, I mean, it's like, it's just insane to me. Like he could have gone to other examples. Like I think he should have gone straight to Honorius and we could talk about Honorius, but saying that Nestorius isn't the heretic. I mean, if you read his anathemas of St. Cyril, like he literally anathematizes the use of the of the term Theotokos. Of course, absolutely. Yeah, everybody, every Orthodox person knows Theotokos is like Orthodoxy one hundred and one. So they're basically saying, as Roman Catholics, we don't really care about Orthodoxy one hundred and one. Yeah, we. That's exactly what we knew all along. That's what we've been saying. Um, all right, so I've got that's all my notes. Um, do you have anything else you want to get to before we move to super chats? And I've got your uh, Twitter is linked. I thought you did great in the debate. I think it was a clear win. Um, what do you want to do? Anything you want to leave with, uh, um, uh, or things that we missed? I will do. Yeah, one one final thing. Sure. Because this wasn't addressed by by him in the in the debate. Was the I brought up the Malatian schism multiple times, um, and what the Malatian schism demonstrates is that you can be in communion with Rome or with the true Church without being in communion with Rome. And what happened in the Malatian schism? Um, the Roman Catholics will always focus on Malatius and they'll say, well, Malatius was brought into communion with Rome. But the issue is Constantinople I appoints Flavian as Malatius' successor. And the Roman church doesn't accept Flavian as the true patriarch until almost 20 years later. And so for those 18, 19 years, the entire rest of the church was in communion with Flavian. And Rome didn't recognize Flavian until they finally submit to uh, the church's decision from Constantinople I. I think it was like 399 uh, when they finally uh, submit to the church's decision, the, the papal seat. So for all those years, all those years, Flavian was in communion with the true church, but not in communion with Rome. And Rome finally submits 
to the church's decision. So all these quotes about how you, you know, you have to be in communion with Rome, um, they quote mine, St. Jerome, um, which isn't even the context of what he was saying. Um, well, those quotes don't matter if we can point to an example where somebody was in communion with the true church, but not in communion with Rome. Single-handedly refutes that whole talking point. Yeah, it does. And uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Now we've got BMX. He sent $15 the other day. Uh, I can't remember if I got to that or not. Thank you, thank you, BMX. Cataclysm, $5. Uh, very, good, <coughs> very good discussion, Luigi. Love to see it. Uh, I feel that it was scummy for Lofton to choose an inquirer to debate and represent orthodoxy. So um, it looked to me like at one point, uh, I, I can't prove this, but he, he was mouthing as the microphone was turned off. It's like he was talking to somebody. So I don't know if somebody was sending him uh, arguments or what, but I thought it was a little odd that he was talking so much with the volume off. Maybe he was talking to his wife or something. I don't know. Brett Sales, $20. This is killer content. It's not Moonbeaver, but it's still killer content nonetheless. Kapow. Yeah, thank you so much. We'll have to revisit uh, our Seeds of Gaia dude that's uh, the Moonbeaver consciousness guy. Cataclysm, $5. P.S. Uh, we're ready for the Jake debate review. Yeah, we're just waiting on Lewis and Kai um, and Dr. Bo to find the time when everybody's not busy to be able to do the, the Dr. Bo, or excuse me, the, uh, the Jake debate review um guys if you would be sure and follow luigi i've got his uh channel or excuse me his uh, twitter linked i'll add his instagram as well because he's got a lot of instagram content that's pretty funny popular people like his his jokes and his quips uh they're good over on uh, ig there is his twitter in the chat if you want to follow him there um anything you want to leave us with before we before we close it out um i mean i appreciate you having me on um you know i i I just want to say I got an overwhelming amount of welcoming messages from from Orthodox people uh, during uh, following the debate. Um, I had people that said that they they that, that my debate uh, was kind of like the last straw for them, like for leaving the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and then one person in particular, when his priest asked <laughs> uh, for a reason, he just sent he sent his priest the debate. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of funny. Nice. Um, but uh, yeah, I just want to uh, say to the Orthodox community, you guys are phenomenal. Uh, you know, I'm excited to, I just got, I was just on Orthodox Kyle. He's releasing that video soon. I'm going on Orthodox Meme Squad in a couple weeks. Um, so I, yeah, you guys have been awesome, super welcoming. So I'm excited to be here and and pretty excited about the future. So. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you did great. It was a phenomenal uh, first outing. So we're looking forward to, uh, you know, some, some excellent future debates. So Everybody be sure and follow uh, Luigi over on uh, his outlets and I will see you guys very soon.